Most of the dominoes were perceived to be here in Asia, and that is one reason the Eisenhower administration spent so much time helping to rebuild the economy of Japan. Washington believed that a democratic and economically powerful Japan would be a counterbalance to the communists in the region. Little did we think then that one day this Japanese economy would be such a powerful threat to our own. The first post-war Japanese products began to trickle onto the American market in the early 50s. Made in Japan then was another way of saying junk. I once discussed with uh, John Foster Dulles, and he told me that, uh, uh, well, Japan will have no opportunity to produce uh, something which we could, uh, Japan could sell to the United States. John Foster Dulles was wrong, and a young Japanese electrician, Akio Morita, set out to prove it. He made the decision during a visit to West Germany in 1953 when he found a small umbrella on a dish of ice cream. I had a ice cream, and on the ice cream, small little bamboo umbrella was put on. And then waiter said, this is from your country. I was very much disappointed because uh, such a, you know, uh, umbrella on the ice cream represents Japan. So uh, seeing this and hearing this, I made up my mind, we should change them. Uh, made in Japan. But we had a big program that uh, our company name, Tokyo Tsushin Kogyo. I found no American can pronounce that name correctly. That's why we, we I, I thought that we cannot use such a bad name on our product. So we, we, we studied many different language and dictionaries and we found that in Latin, sonus, the sound, and English word, sunny boy, S-O-N-N-Y. We thought we are a group of sunny boys and the hundred sound business. So we decided to make a shot. We created this S-O-N-Y. S-O-N-Y, Sony. Sony didn't have much of a ring to it then. After all, in the 1950s, American technology was king. Better made, more dependable, more nearly trouble-free than products made in any such quantities anywhere else in the world. Introducing the American way of life on the threshold of the golden 60s. Color, style, comfort, utility, and convenience. America was a consumer's paradise. The first business computers were in evidence. You could fly all the way across America in a jet now. You could go to the movies in 3D. The world had not yet been tied together by television, but America was fascinated. Playhouse 90. Tonight starring... Jack Palance. In what novel, by what name, do the Benevolent Brothers appear? The Charitable Brothers in Nicholas Nicholson. You're right for 32 Elvis Presley. Television was not just entertainment. Pat Hotley, NBC News, New York. And David Brinkley, NBC News, Washington. Good evening, everybody. Coast to coast, Douglas Edwards reporting. A slow motion view. Americans began to see world events and their president almost daily. The medium was still new. The political message from the administration was as cold as American-Soviet relations. There is not a single country in this hemisphere which has not been penetrated by the apparatus of international communism acting under orders from Moscow. The Soviet Union has got designs on the American hemisphere. Stay out of this hemisphere and don't try to start your plans and your conspiracies over here. Moscow did not heed the warning. Soviet-American competition would become global. Here in Egypt in 1956, President Eisenhower turned on three of America's allies. 
the French, the British, and the Israelis had invaded this place called Suez. They had decided that Egypt's president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, was a threat to their interests in the region. And they used as the pretext for their invasion the fact that Nasser had nationalized the Suez Canal. President Eisenhower's actions marked the end of British and French dominance in the Middle East and the beginning of America's. And so it was the French who finally dreamed up the idea of getting the Israelis to make a move and using the Israelis as a stalking horse so that the Israelis would attack towards the Suez Canal through the Sinai Peninsula. And we and the French would go in to stop the war, put out the fire, uh, and, uh, oh, here we are on the Suez Canal. How extraordinary. British and French troops in occupation. That was uh, what was finally done, which, of course, involved everybody telling lies through their teeth to the House of Commons, to the French Parliament, and to the United Nations. And, of course, which was what particularly angered Eisenhower to the Americans. Once again, Eisenhower saw colonial powers trying to hang on. With the Suez Canal in ruins, he forced the British, the French, and the Israelis to end their occupation and withdraw. There can be no peace without law. And there can be no law if we were to invoke one code of international conduct for those who oppose us and another for our friends. Nasser didn't appreciate what we did to save him. He just got rougher in terms of our interest. But second, even important, it destroyed the British and the French as world powers. Uh, from that time on, Britain and France would not play a major role on the world scene. As colonial domination dissolved in the Middle East, America would find itself filling the vacuum and trying to keep the Soviets out. In the 1950s, Moscow was making it clear that America could do nothing in Eastern Europe. And here in Berlin, we discovered that the Soviets had their own version of the domino theory. And they would move brutally to ensure that the first domino never fell. In the 1950s, in three Eastern European countries, there were movements for greater liberalization. The Kremlin made sure that they were crushed. In East Berlin, during June of 1953, thousands of workers rioted against Soviet domination. Martial law was invoked, Soviet troops moved in, 38 Berliners were killed and almost 400 injured. That Soviet domino didn't fall. In 1956, in the Polish city of Poznan, 30,000 Poles rebelled. At least 500 were killed and that Soviet domino was secure. And then there was Hungary, the bloodiest revolution of them all. It began in the fall. Tens of thousands of Hungarians were killed. The United States would learn a hard lesson in the limitations of power. It was a war on the day the Russian onslaught started, November 4. It started early in the morning. It was still dark, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. Then they started to shell Budapest. Attention, attention. This is Free Kossuth Radio Budapest. In the early hours of the morning, Soviet troops have started an attack against the Hungarian capital. Our troops are engaged in battle with the Soviet forces. We were at home. I ran to the telephone to call the Associated Press in London. I reached the operator. I gave her, I, I, I said, connect me this London, this number. She was crying on the telephone. I can't connect you anymore. I can't. That's what she said. It was a tragedy, and a tragedy to which we contributed. We contributed to it because uh, some of our programs that were carried on radio in Hungary uh, called for the Hungarian people to rise up. I think many of them got the impression that we would come to their assistance. Uh, it was a terribly difficult decision for Eisenhower not to do so. But he looked at the situation, and the situation was that the Soviet Union had overwhelming uh, conventional superiority in the area. Uh, so what is our answer to Hungary? 
to bomb Moscow, Eisenhower had to make that decision and decided uh, that uh, it would not be credible for him to threaten to do so.